Welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and various departments at the university, including political science, urban studies, channel studies, uh, economics, uh, and American cultures. Uh, today we have a panel of experts who have studied the uh, LA throughout its history, but we're really going to talk about the new Los Angeles. Uh, I'm Fernando Guerra, director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and we have with us today uh, Kevin Murray, former state legislator, served in the state senate for eight years, representing the 26th district, and also uh, represented the, the, the similar area in the uh, assembly for uh, four years as well. Uh, currently, he has his own firm and has previously worked as an attorney uh, with the William Morris Agency and also comes from a famous political family where his father also served in the state legislature and currently serves in the Water Replenishment District. Kevin Murray, thank you. Uh, next, next to him is Nicholas Rosendahl, Professor of History at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, Nick Rosenthal has had a project that's reimagining Indian country, American Indians, and cities in modern America. This is a book link uh, study which examines the 20th century migration of American Indian people to the cities of the United States. Um, Los Angeles currently consists of the uh, city with the largest number of Native Americans, and as we had discussed earlier, over 50% uh, of Native Americans now live in cities, so we'll talk to him about that. Uh, Professor Nick Rosenthal. Uh, next, next to him is uh, Professor Steve Geary from the University of uh, uh, California at San Diego, almost at the University of San Diego, but it's the University of California at San Diego. Uh, he is a professor of political science there. He's also an adjunct professor of history, and he's also the director of the Urban Studies Program. Uh, Steve has um, written all kinds of important books on Los Angeles and on urban politics. Uh, the uh, most famous uh, in terms of urban politics is Rainbow, Rainbow's End, Irish Americans and the Dilemmas of the Urban Machine Politics, 1840 to 1985. He also wrote a great book called Globalizing LA, Trade, Infrastructure, and Regional Development. And also another book on water politics that's really about the Metropolitan Water District. It's called um, Chinatown, the Metropolitan Water District, Growth and the Environment. And it's, uh, and it's got too many uh, 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 book chapters and, and uh, articles to, to go over. And now running down the aisle to join the list is Dr. Ray Sonenshine, who is Professor of Political Science at Cal State University Fullerton. He's the recipient of the inaugural Carol Barnes Excellence in Teaching Award this year. He has been teaching political science on campus since 1982. He's old. Um, I, mean, that, that, I mean, most of our students weren't even born then. Um, he is an expert on American government, urban government, campaigns and elections, racial and minority politics, and California and Los Angeles politics. Uh, he's often call, uh, called upon to offer new commentary. I see him on TV all the time, I read his quotes all the time. And he is the author of Politics in Black and White, Race and Power in Los Angeles, which was published in 1993, and it's really all about the uh, Bradley administration. He's also the author of a book called City at State, Secession, Reform, and the Battle for Los Angeles, uh, published in 2004. He, he uh, again, too many articles and, and uh, book chapters to go over in terms of the, what, he, what he has written about. Um, what I'm going to ask uh, is for Steve Geary to start and talk to us about the state of studying in Los Angeles. He recently wrote an article that just appeared this month in an important urban uh, studies journal that talks about the uh, contending theories and models about how to study Los Angeles and whether Los Angeles is the example of uh, urban politics that we want to, to understand. Um, so, uh, Steve, tell us about what's going on. Tell us a little bit about that article. And just remind uh, uh, people that uh, you're here at uh, Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series. Steve, here. Thank you, Fernando. Testing, one, two, three. Can you hear back there? Yeah, right. Okay, They're all on. That's all right. Not live, so we're okay. <laughs> we're gonna get to edit our statements too. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. I mean, 
benefit to you. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to start, Fernando. You know what? Why don't you go, go ahead and start, and then we'll okay. uh, capture the. Okay. Uh, now, now, understand that I'm here sort of under false pretenses. I thought that this was going to be about studying the old LA, not the new LA. <laughs> how, can you, how can you study and the new LA without the old LA? But they're very different. Very, very different. Uh, look, I am from Los Angeles. I teach at the University of California, San Diego. I teach an LA politics and policy making course. The, the fire marshal closes the class because so many people want to come. Not because of me, but because 45% of our students are from greater Los Angeles, not from San Diego. Two hours away from home, far enough away from mommy and dad, but you can come back and get your laundry done. So, a lot of Angelinos down there. We bring people like Xavier Arslovsky, uh, Tim Brick, Ron Gastelum, former uh, uh, executive uh, general manager of the Metropolitan Water District, uh, Dan Garcia, who uh, was uh, the citizen commissioner extraordinaire. And a graduate of the Liberty Administration, uh, got sacked in the Reardon Administration. Uh, but most of what I do is to study old LA. And I'm now writing a book, actually, it's a much darker view of San Diego. It was going to be called Troubled Paradise. It's now called after the disastrous 2007 fire, the Cedar Fire, Paradise Plundered. It's a cautionary tale. And I always tell people that if you, in San Diego, if you want to see the future of San Diego politics, study Los Angeles. San Diego is like Los Angeles was in the 1950s and 1960s. <laughs> A strong downtown Republican business establishment, weak, limited minority empowerment, labor starting to make some gains, but the kind of contestation that you saw in LA politics in the 50s and 60s, you're seeing in San Diego politics uh, today. But coming up here and talking about the new Los Angeles as opposed to the old Los Angeles, which I've studied, I would turn in a sense my statement around. If you want to understand the future of Los Angeles, certainly policy-wise, then you might want to study San Diego, where the fiscal crisis that is now the tsunami that has now hit City Hall, you've seen, you know, the, the argument about, uh, about layoffs, uh, ballooning of pension payments. We've been doing this in San Diego for the last 10 years. We have a lot of experience with circling the toilet of bankruptcy. We've come very close and we still have to file bankruptcy. So San Diego, in a sense, with, in terms of a sort of policy paralysis, the inability to do airport expansion, uh, difficulties in terms of diversifying their water portfolio, uh, uh, having becoming more and more difficult right to adequately fund public services like fire protection. In a sense, up here in Los Angeles, you might want to study San Diego because San Diego in this case is the leading indicator, not the lagging indicator, of fiscal austerity and what it does and policy gridlock with respect to uh, to uh, major infrastructure. Yeah, but every major city in America is facing fiscal crisis, and every state. I know we keep focusing on California, the budget problem, the budget problem in the city because we're here, but New York, Michigan. San Diego, San Diego, in a sense, is the canary in the cage in the mine. It was an early and eager adopter of what we call a free lunch mentality. You want the services you don't want to pay for. It is a poster child for what's wrong with Proposition 13. It was the only big city in California. Explain to our students Proposition 13. 13. Remember, they, they were only born in 1992. Property, property tax relief, uh, circa 1978, passed by California voters, put a lid right on a primary source of revenue for local government. San Diego was the only big city that that believed in Proposition 13 to the extent that it never found new revenue sources. And in a sense, right, it's, it, 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 it is, the, it is a, sort of an early indicator of what the future is going to be. Now look, if you want to understand the new Los Angeles, as Fernando started this morning, we need to talk a little bit about the old Los Angeles. I'm a public historian. 
Uh, I studied public agencies, bureaucracies, uh, which have been so critical to the early development of Los Angeles. That could be the water system, the Department of Water and Power, uh, the port system, the airport system, regional agencies that were birthed out of Los Angeles bureaucracies, the Metropolitan Water District, which is region wide, but really came out of the Department of Water and Power. But that system of, and, and of course the importance of the business community and business bureaucratic partnerships, that system of politics in building big infrastructure projects, we call it the, the culture of Mulholland, the vast LA in a sense right was one of the great leaders in terms of precocious uh, infrastructure development uh, in the entire country and we would not be here today if we didn't have those things. But tell the students who Mulholland is. I mean, they know Mulholland. Mul Mulholland Drive, Mulholland Falls. He was sort of the father of water. He was the, the, the water engineer, right, who planned uh, and helped finance and build uh, with public money uh, the Owens Valley Aqueduct that allowed Los Angeles to grow from a small pueblo. Uh, into the megalopolis that it is uh, that it is today, but that that game, uh, that that system, right, of sort of bureaucracy-driven growth and infrastructure, is largely over in Los Angeles, in both the city and the region today. And, and it never happened in San Diego, is what you're saying. And it never happened in San Diego, partly because of the proximity to Los Angeles. It could be a free rider on the port system. 90% of San Diego vessel cargo comes in and out of LA and Long Beach. Uh, LAX is their international airport, uh, certainly in terms of air cargo. But Los Angeles, right, can't do that. And it did the heavy lifting for the entire Southern California region. Uh, there's a whole new sort of po political and policy environment today. There are a whole set of new stakeholders. It's a much more diverse group. The environmental community, uh, uh, neighborhood groups that are impacted by things like here, uh, LAX expansion plans. And what you really have in a variety of areas is, is policy gridlock on those big tickets. But we, we have policy gridlock in Washington, D.C. That's all you hear about. Obama can't get anything done. The Republicans, they don't have the 60 votes now. We have policy gridlock up in the state legislature. Um, every, everywhere is policy gridlock. What is unique about LA or San Diego, or is it just part of the current uh, economic it's, environment? It's, it's that Los Angeles for years didn't have that. Los Angeles worshipped growth. The infrastructure was its weapon of growth and, and empire. Uh, but that really, the last 20 or 30 years, has, has largely ended. Explain to the students that if someone from San Diego wants to take a flight just about anywhere, they have to come up to LA. Uh, uh, up to 405, or even take a commuter from San Diego to LA. Well, look, I, of course, we're being taped here, but, but in many respects, San Diego is Los Angeles' largest suburb. It is, it has depended upon Los Angeles water, on its port and its airport system uh, for, for the last uh, 50 to 75 years. Hey, but they have a football team that we don't. The <laughs> water used to be out the yeah. yeah. That's right. But they don't and and, uh, and we'd, we'd like to give them the Clippers back because they originally came out of the They can have the Clippers. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, long, the long and the short of it is that the way that LA did business, LA really was a, a trendsetter and a leader in, in terms of the role of bureaucracy, infrastructure provision, you know, that whole game, right, is, is basically, it's much more complicated. And remember that San Diego got the Constellation Prize. It got the Navy rather than early industrial development. It also decided that its crown jewels were not going to be ports and airports. It was going to be the beaches, Balboa Park, the park system. The zoo. The zoo, the amenities. Uh, and Los Angeles, right, rather than becoming a greenfield, became a brownfield. Now we have to do the remediation that we didn't do. We're talking about the greening of the ports. We're talking about solar energy. 
A lot of this, it's a much more complicated environment, and these are also much, very expensive alternatives. So, in a sense, you know, it's, it's a whole new game. Yeah. Let me get to Rafe, and then after we have Rafe, I'm going to have um, uh, Professor Rosendahl and uh, Senator Murray kind of comment on what they've heard. Um, the transition from uh, old LA to new LA, and specifically the inclusion of uh, previously excluded groups like African Americans, uh, yet uh, the Bradley administration also continued a lot of the policies that Steve's talking about. But uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sonoshan has written quite a bit about this transition and the inclusion of new players that uh, Steve alluded to. Talk to us about the, uh, that transition from uh, and the Bradley administration, how that, uh, how that came about and the consequences of that. Um, sure, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late. It's a very LA excuse that was traffic. So I'm sorry, but I raised as much as I could. Um, just from my own work, um, the only peer city Los Angeles has is New York City in my research. Uh, in other words, I'm from New York, New Jersey. If you're from New Jersey, by the way, you say you're from New York. I grew up just outside New York City and lived my whole academic and personal career with a comparison between New York and Los Angeles. And that could be a very harsh and rough comparison, even back when New York actually had a basketball team uh, we had to deal with that issue now. Of course, it's the Celtics, not the Knicks. But as a graduate student on the East Coast, I had to deal with the fact that I wanted to study Los Angeles, and the people in political science thought that was not a topic worthy of study. Not only was Los Angeles not a peer, but it was non-existent as a city. And that led to the fundamental thing I focused on, which is <clears throat> how Los Angeles and San Diego, and the whole West and Southwest, managed to operate without as big a public sector, without as much politics in a traditional sense, fewer public employees, a, a smaller sense of what a mayor and council could do to run and dominate things. And to my immense surprise, I found that while that was a disadvantage, in some cases it was a real advantage in terms of openness. And as I began to trace the rise of the Tom Bradley Coalition in Los Angeles, which was built around African Americans and Jewish liberal voters, um, I wrote what at the time started out as a fairly controversial book because the people on the East Coast, growing up in a partisan, highly organized system where conflict between groups was fundamental, uh, these two groups formed a winning coalition and in fact became the most successful urban coalition, I believe, in the 20th century in the United States. I had a very difficult time getting a hearing for that. Fortunately, I had friends here like Steve and Fernando and Byron Jackson and others who were following the same events, but nobody believed it on the East Coast. And the reason was a nonpartisan city without a huge public sector cannot have real politics. But one of the things I discovered is that people in California, in Los Angeles in particular, had to have the ability to form coalitions because they didn't have as much formal power as political people do on the East Coast. The mayor of New York City could be better nicknamed God, uh, since the mayor has as much formal authority or more than the president of the United States in their political system, they really don't need to form coalitions the way a mayor of Los Angeles has to. So what that meant was that new groups had an opening, they had an opportunity, they didn't have a political machine to fight the way they did in New York City and Chicago and Detroit and Baltimore. Well, you might ask yourself, why does everybody take Los Angeles seriously today? I will tell you bluntly, the main reason was a guy named Rodney King. If you look at the events of 91 and 92, that and, Los and Angeles was to remind you that most of our students were born in 1990 or 91. That's how long ago that was. Okie dokie. Uh, Rodney King was the young African-American motorist who was beaten by LAPD officers and it was filmed and shown worldwide. And a year later, when the officers were acquitted, there was the largest urban disorder in American history. And, I, and because, because people didn't want to go inside, many stayed inside, and therefore we have all these students. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think I'm not going to go there at this point. I'm a visitor, so I'm just going to let you tell those jokes. Um, I had the good fortune to be so slow in my book that my book didn't come out until after those events had just passed, which meant suddenly people wanted to know about race in Los Angeles. So what I discovered was that this crazy Los Angeles, so disdained by everybody in my field, actually had done something much more substantial than people had in New York. 
I got in a lot of arguments over that with people on the East Coast. Well, then I discovered that Los Angeles was also dealing with the rise of immigration, and the same factors were taking place, which was the lack of a strong public sector political machine to block new groups from coming in. By the way, no matter what we tell you in our urban politics class, you have to go back and read Steve's first book to discover that political machines and bosses weren't always so great about bringing new groups in. It's a wonderful book that I hope you, you may can read for him. I, I referenced it in the uh, opening remarks that you missed. Okay, you're assigned it now. But in Los Angeles, where those machines didn't exist, new groups could break in. And what I'm studying now with a colleague, John Malenkoff from New York, is we're doing comparative studies of New York and LA, and why is it that the child of a Latino immigrant from Mexico is now the mayor of Los Angeles, when a Latino candidate in New York City, the historic city of the melting pot, had no serious chance to get elected. But before I go into the, the sort of romantic notion about how everything works out so well in Los Angeles, I have to say as a scholar and a realist that many times you feel the absence of those political institutions that they have on the East Coast, especially during times of trouble like today. And you look at the difficulty the mayor and council in Los Angeles have with literally balancing the budget with generating enough political power to make hard decisions without going to the city council and having as many people as are sitting in this room right now screaming at the council members, and five minutes later the council members said, well, maybe we'll just borrow the difference. We won't make any budget cuts. Trust me, in New York City, it doesn't operate that way because the elected officials have far greater formal authority and are far less subject to the winds of politics out there um, because they have all that great formal authority. So I have to say that right now, and it hurts me because John Mollenhoff and I have a kind of friendly rivalry about the two cities, and I have to say that right now Los Angeles is having more trouble than New York in dealing with its economic situation. You have anti-government people everywhere, uh, flooding city hall, screaming at the elected officials. In New York City, they don't mind lots of elected officials doing lots of political stuff. The taxi drivers have an opinion on everything. Everybody's a voter, everybody's politically active. Out here, they can't wait to throw you out of office, either through term limits, cut your revenue, starve the beast, pass tax limitation measures, and you have to beg and plead for a little bit of money. So I guess to sum up, the great advantage of our way of doing business is that because of the weakness of political institutions, there are greater openings for coalitions, for new groups to come in, and I prefer that. I would trade the other problem, but the other problem you should not glide over. The fiscal and economic crisis of weak political institutions in the face of angry citizens, uh, diverse forces, and government fragmentation leaves Los Angeles and San Diego and the rest of the Southwest subject to terrible winds of change to lack of planning, to traffic that held me up today. If this were in New York, the mayor could have just ordered the cars to park, and they would have just sent me directly here. I kid you not, by the way, uh, to understand the power of the mayor um, versus the mayor of Los Angeles. Well, uh, it's kind of on that. Tell them that in New York, the mayor controls the schools. In L.A., he does uh, I worked on charter reform in Los Angeles to look at the power of the two mayors of New York and L.A., and actually Steve did quite a bit of work on that at the same time. And while the mayor of Los Angeles has more power than the current mayor at the time Richard Reardon said he had, compared to the mayor of New York, the mayor controls the schools, the, the Board of Education is now a department of the city government, uh, the mayor is completely in charge, but Mayor Viragosa had to spend his first term gaining political control of the school district through the Board of Education, which he now basically has, but he can lose that at any time. The mayor appoints and removes all department heads. They work for the mayor. Uh, the mayor has thousands of people at his or her disposal. Uh, the city council is basically a rubber stamp. Uh, somebody once said that was unfair to rubber stamps in, in talking about the New York City Council. Uh, the mayor is basically, as long as they remain popular, uh, there's virtually no limitation to the mayor's authority. 
New York City is the only city in the country that has what's called residual powers. That in other words, anything not in the charter goes to the mayor. In every other city, it goes to the city council. That just shows you. It's a dominating culture, which is why as soon as you become mayor of New York, you think about being president. The only downside is that you're from New York City. And everybody hates New York City, but nobody ever gets elected as mayor of New York City. But the formal powers of uh, the differences are enormous. We are here at Loyola Marymount University uh, and taking a look at a panel about New LA and Old LA. And we have with us uh, Dr. Ray Sonenstein from Cal State Fullerton, Dr. Steve Erie from the University of California, San Diego, Dr. Nick Rosendahl from Loyola Marymount University, and State Senator, or former State Senator, uh, Kevin Murray. I'm going to turn to um, Nick Rosendahl. He's a historian. Uh, takes a look at uh, old LA, and uh, what's uh, your response to what you're hearing from these uh, two political scientists who think they're historians? <laughs> well, I guess I'd start by saying that uh, the historians of Los Angeles have also faced a kind of uphill battle in arguing that their work is important, that Los Angeles is an important historical site, um, and in decentering the profession and the fields in history, whether it's urban history or whether it's uh, 20th century U.S. history, in, in, in our argument, they ought to take a closer look at Los Angeles. Um, I think the Brown and King riots were important in 1992 for convincing people that Los Angeles might be worth studying. But I also think that a very important book came out in 1991 by Mike Davis called City of Courts, um, which did a couple of things. It, first, it predicted the riots. Um, the second thing it did was that it, uh, it convinced many people that Los Angeles was just a great place to study the modern America. And since then, there has been an unbroken wave of work by Los Angeles historians on the city um, arguing for, uh, for you know, reading the history of the United States through, through Los Angeles. Um, so I you know, also study the, the old history, um, but something I argue in my classes is that this old history can help us understand the new LA, the old LA can help us understand the new LA, um, that, it can, that we can learn from the mistakes failures, decisions with unintended consequences of the past, that we can learn from the successes and the good decisions and the, the noble attempts at building a more progressive and egalitarian and socially responsible and sustainable Los Angeles that we can, that we've seen in the past. And we can use this to try to inform some of the decisions we're making today. So at the very end of the class, we, we always finish by talking about say, development in Los Angeles and trying to learn from you know, Travis Ravine and uh, Bunker Hill and freeway development um, from the Century City development in the 1960s that was done with, with no consideration whatsoever uh, or a blank disregard for, for transportation needs and what it was going to do in terms of tying up the city. Um, that when we look to downtown and look at the redevelopment of downtown, for instance, we ought to be applying these lessons of the past um, uh, to, to, to that kind of thing. Um, when we look at you know, the Los Angeles of today, the new LA, the multi-ethnic Los Angeles, that certainly we can look to the past for a lot of bad decisions. We can look at the past, well, LA's past that's clouded by racism and discrimination against African Americans, against Latinos, against Asian Americans, against um, uh, Native Americans, against immigrants from all over the world. Um, certainly the 1992 riots seem to be a culmination of, this, of these bad decisions in the past, uh, you know, truly multi-ethnic riots. Um, all the way up to the present, we think about black Latino tensions, um, you know, riots in LA County Jail, or the, some of the tensions in the Harvard Gateway area over the last several years. Um, however, I also think we can look to the old history to find possibilities for interethnic uh, cooperation. Um, historian George Sanchez has done wonderful work on Boyle Heights in the 1950s and 1960s, looking at uh, coalitions between uh, Jews and um, uh, Latinos in the neighborhood. Um, their political organizing around a candidate like Edward Roy Ball. Um, uh, you know, Tom Bradley very much, I think, learned from Roy Ball and picked up on that, those types of uh, interesting coalitions, um, as did, of course, uh, our current mayor, uh, Billy Ragosa. Um, there are more informal models of interesting cooperation, whether it's um, uh, work that's looked at um, music venues in Los Angeles or dance halls, um, or even uh, an article I have had students this year finish the class with was a 
article about the Kobe Korean barbecue trucks in Los Angeles, right? And Korean tacos in Los Angeles, and you know how this represents the kind of uh, uh, organic fusing of, of different groups in Los Angeles, and um, whether it's the product itself, you know, Korean taco, um, or uh, or the, the, the people who are flocking to these trucks to, to, to buy um, these tacos. In some ways, I think this represents the best of Los Angeles and some of the possibilities for Los Angeles. Um, one thing I say a lot in my classes and, uh, is that uh, generally policymakers and politicians have not been good historians. Uh, no, sure. <laughs> uh, but but um, you know that they haven't learned enough from the past as they're making their decisions about the future. Um, that they haven't learned from the mistakes of the past and they haven't learned from the successes of the past. Um, I, I, uh, as I make this argument, however, I also, um, you know, hope uh, have found someone who, I, who, who claims to be trying to prove me wrong. Um, uh, you know, Charlie Beck, the you know, uh, chief, um, actually says he's learning from the past. Right? That he he came up during what he calls the dark days of the LAPD um, under the uh, reforms that were first put into place by uh, Chief Parker, William Parker, and then um, you know he came up under the administration of Daryl Gates, one of his proteges. Um, Many historians would argue that it's you know, these types of policies and reforms that largely explain something like the 1992 riots. Um, you know, he is is arg arguing that he has learned from that and is trying to change the direction of the LPD. You know, it was fascinating to see for that. So, yeah. uh, Nick, I'm going to ask you a question and then want uh, uh, Ray to speak to us answer before we turn over and start picking on the senator. Um, Five years after a student who has graduated from your LA politics class, or LA history, or LA, excuse me, LA history, okay, and Steve and Rafe, what are the three things that you would want that student to remember? Because this would be like a good intro question. That would be a good intro question. You know, I want, I want them to, to think about some of the, the promises of Los Angeles. I want them to think about um, how so many different groups have come to Los Angeles because of what it seemed to offer them, um, and uh, different groups that have, in fact, you know, realized some of the, those opportunities. Um, you know, I, I deal with Native Americans in Los Angeles. Um, for instance, um, I uh, you know, write about American Indians who came to work in the Hollywood film industry during the 20th century, in the teens and the 20s, and worked as actors and um, uh, technical advisors and stunt people. Um, and uh, for many of them, this was a, an incredible opportunity. Um, I mean, everyone wanted to come to Hollywood during this time, right? Um, but here are people who are living uh, in very impoverished environments, uh, people who um, may have begun their lives um, uh, fighting the US government and then felt they would be confined to a reservation for the rest of their lives or, or faced uh, Boarding schools run by the federal government that taught them that they had to uh, not couldn't practice their Indian culture anymore, and all of a sudden here they are in Hollywood, uh, working in Hollywood with <coughs> film actors. Um, just just out of curiosity, curiosity, so who would be like the famous case that, like that, the success story? Well, and then the the flip side of that though is that there's still serious limitations. Oh, sure. Um, so most, most of these actors, actors did not play star roles. We don't remember their names today. Someone like Luther Standing Bear, who eventually became an activist uh, for American Indians. Um, you know, he's one of the ones who, who if you look close enough, you'll, find, you'll see his name. But Especially we, during the era of the Western and the John Wayne movies, there were a lot of uh, supposed Native Americans on film, but some of them actually were. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's something I try to impart to students is, is that. Uh, I would kind of uh, label, so one of the things you want students to remember is what I would call multicultural immigration, optimism, and reality. Or opportunities and limitations, and how groups work to negotiate this. Right. Um, Steve, it's it's an LA, it's an LA, LA, LA politics class. Okay, okay three things. Not, not five, not ten, three. We might even just leave it with two. Uh, the first is that historically, LA is a city that should not be. It's an absolutely improbable city. Uh, San Diego had the natural harbor. We didn't have water. We were half the size 
square mileage of the city and county of San Francisco a hundred years ago. How did LA improbable Los Angeles grow so big? And some of those decisions were mistakes. But how did LA grow? And uh, it's uh, uh, either Mike Davis or Kevin Starr called it Bismarckian Municipal Will. The, uh, the Iron Chancellor of Germany. Oh, Bismarckian Municipal Will. It was really about leadership in the public and the private sectors in terms of providing the, the ingredients, the infrastructure, the formula for growth. So it's an improbable story. The fast forward to today, because it's not only course that I teach on the city of Los Angeles, it's on the five county Los Angeles region. The difficulty of regional cooperation and coordination over a whole host of things. And my case study of the Metropolitan Water District, which even complicates matters more because San Diego, as well as the LA city and suburbs, right, are, are, are members. And uh, they've been fighting since day one. But the whole question of how you manage a megalopolis of, you know, the county, what, 10 million? The metropolitan area pushing 20 million now. When it's politically fragmented, five counties, hundreds of municipalities, the city of Los Angeles certainly, uh, historically, right, has, has had a, a huge impact on the region. Uh, but the region, the centrifugal forces, the forces that pull away are so great. How do you get together, right, to deal with, uh, with regional projects and regional issues? Los Angeles is a work in progress. Fragmentation, improbable LA, two things to remember. Two. Ray not five, not three. If you take my LA politics class, you'll come out of it with three things. One. The enormity of the significance of Tom Bradley in Los Angeles history as a person who uh, basically transformed a conservative, sleepy city run and directed by its, uh, an out-of-control police department that was essentially a government unto itself and managed as an African-American to get elected mayor, rein in the police department, and open up the doors of City Hall to a multi-ethnic community and also as the precursor to Barack Obama. In fact, the one character in American political history you can look at as drawing a direct line to Barack Obama it is Tom Bradley. So, you know, every city generates remarkable people, but Tom Bradley is... Yeah, I think Tom Bradley also discovered the internet, and what else did he do? He did, and he invented fire as well. Um, it's underappreciated uh, how valuable that was. All right, I'm a bit of a Tom Bradley fan. But I do believe that it just happens that this city had one of the most important historic figures in American history, and I continue to find linkages. I just wrote something that came out today, quoting one of Tom Bradley's aides, something he said about Tom Bradley that applies to Barack Obama. He said, people mistake civility for weakness. That was something Warren Wiener said to me about Tom Bradley. And I think it very much applies to President Obama as well, for many of the same reasons. Secondly, if you take my class, we'll take a field trip to City Hall. Uh, we have a wonderful time. We eat lunch at Philippe's. All right, all right. You have to eat lunch at Philippe's. But what you learn is that the elected officials in Los Angeles are just right out there. You can walk up and talk to them. My class sits there. The controller comes by. The council president comes by. The deputy mayors come by. The council members. And to appreciate that if you wanted to, you could go down to City Hall like I did in 1974 and walk in the door and get a job somewhere. You cannot do that on the East Coast. And that comparison is very important because the political structure is so developed there that if you don't know someone, you don't have a relative, you don't have a connection, you can pretty much forget it. And the third thing goes exactly with what Steve is saying. With all of that, you learn how hard it is to do collective action, how difficult it is to expand Los Angeles Airport one foot when it's one of the most overcrowded airports in the country right now, and all the deals you have to make with cities like El Segundo and Hawthorne and all these other little Lilliputians surrounding Gulliver on the ground. It takes the skills of a major diplomat 
to be a major elected official in Southern California. If you learn those three things, I will give you an A. And a lamb sandwich is the best at Philippe's. Again, we're here at Loyola Marymount University, and we're going to ask uh, State Senator Kevin Murray, who's been sitting patiently by. Not very patiently. Not very patiently. <laughs> but a, a couple of questions, kind of his reaction to what he's been hearing from uh, Dr. Ray Sonenshine, Dr. Steve Beery, and Dr. Nick Rosendahl. Um, to kind of react to that, but also in, in, in the following. Gridlock, lack of leadership, lack of collective action, we elected you and a bunch of your colleagues to the state legislature, to city council, and you guys just can't get it right, is what many people say. I'm not saying this, I'm just, I just read about it. Of course, not you. you know. no, I think those guys have been saying that. Here's what, first of all, as a politician or former politician. And What's certain, a politician know as a politician? We're always looking forward, we're never looking back. So I think to the extent that we don't stand on history, that's probably a correct assessment. But I would also argue that politics and policy are not about the institutions, but about the people and their personality. So every situation, every era um, is unique. Um, by the way, you should all buy a race book. For a black guy who grew up in politics, it's a fabulous uh, book about, about that era and the people involved. Just remind me what it's called. Uh Politics. Politics and black and white. Right? Politics and black and white. There's a definite brown in there. Um, <laughs> when, well, during that time, you know, I just, just, just want to make a comment. Um, here's the other thing. Like, like, for instance, I think the analogy of Bradley to Obama is correct, but for different reasons. You know, uh, uh, one of the reasons Bradley, everybody talks about the Bradley Black Jewish Coalition, there weren't enough blacks and Jews to put them together to elect a man. The, what happened was everyone so hated the previous guy, Sam Yorty, that that coalition was able to build upon, and so all sorts of people all over the city ended up electing Tom Bradley. Um, but much like Obama, people had to hate the last guy so much they would give the black guy a shot. And, and, and we kind of laughed at that, but, but I think that there's a certain Truth to that. So is that, that some, is some? That, is that how you got elected? They hated the other guy? And... No, I was a no one see. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, but my actually is part of uh, my seat, which was the 26th, uh, uh, in the 47th Assembly District, was Baldwin Hills, some of South Central, but also Culver City, West LA, uh, uh, Beverly Woods, Chevy Hill. So it clearly was a mix of, of, of Jews and blacks. And by the way, if you live in Culver City, for instance, since Julian Dixon got elected in 1960, in the mid-60s, you have always been represented at every level of government by somebody like him. Um, so the normal attitudes about ethnic except, voting... Except the city council, which is really interesting. So the whole Culver City, city, city the, council. The whole Culver city, city council is white. Right. But the state... There might be three black people that actually live in Culver City. But, um, but, 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 but the analogy of Bradley to Obama based upon people so hating the other guy that people who might not otherwise have thought of, of being for either Bradley or um, Obama at least gave them a shot. Now, of course, they both had great skills and great abilities that were able to take advantage of that. But I think that's also an interesting dynamic. Um, my dad was sort of part of the... Jewish Black Coalition, not with Bradley, but with Murder Diamond, which was a whole different. Do I, do I talk about that? Yeah. Well, that so was, that was a counter you, you have to you have to read Ray's book to understand this. But the Black community also had two different factions. There was the Bradley Coalition and the Diamond Coalition. My dad happened to be part of the Diamond Coalition, and so why? It's why? Why? Um, because I think that's the guy that he met when he got interested in politics. Um, and they and and actually, Mervyn Diamond got more other black elected officials elected than Bradley by far. Uh, and most people would argue again. I don't know, did, did you go into the Bradley governor thing in your book? Yeah. So uh, most people would believe that Bradley is not governor because in the general election he ref he he decided not to do big get out the vote campaigns with black voters. And so it wasn't that black voters voted against him, but they just didn't show up that day. So unlike what we saw in 08 with every single African-American black, 
and right. and right. right. the three couple city, they all came out. <laughs> right. to, they to all came out. Uh, Here's the other thing I would say about LA uh, in terms of its ability to govern now. Here's what LA doesn't have that other big cities have, and even San Diego has it. LA has no more city fathers. There used to be a group of, you know, Republican guys who were business owners and ran corporations who mostly had big offices in big office buildings downtown and went to the California Club uh, and helped make decisions or helped give at least sage advice um, to the leadership. Um, New York still has that. In fact, I'm reading a book now about um, Lazar Frez, which is a big investment bank company. But in the 90s, I think, New York had a big fiscal problem. And what did they do? They went and got a guy named Felix Rotten, who was the most important business investment banker in the world, to help them solve their financial issues. And he volunteered for that position for, I don't know, five, almost 10 years, if you count it all, to help get them out of fiscal trouble. We had no one like that in Los Angeles anymore. The closest thing we've got is Eli Broad, and he has enemies too. And the other, on the other side, I would say the ADG guy, Tim White Whitney. Yeah, Tim, they just wrote a whole article about him on in Sunday's LA Times that talks about right. Tim, a whole profile. So the only, because Tim, and, and by the way, Eli Broad is mostly retired from business and doing philanthropic things. Tim White is still building things. But those are the only two we have. You know, we used to have that head of Arco and all those famous names you see on buildings, Amundsen, Doheny, none of those families and or companies exist in Los Angeles anymore. And the power has shifted somewhat to the west side and Beverly Hills. Um, but though the, the, the people on the west side of Beverly Hills have many more things pulling at them. We're trying to raise money for Loyola, we're trying to raise money for USC, or we're trying to raise money for our yeshiva, or we're trying to, so they're doing all sorts of things other than making sure that the, 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 the city is put together well. And then the last thing I would say, I would have, but actually the last two things, because he's got that look like, you, you gotta hurry up. The last two things I would say is that we do have a weak mayor system, and we used to say that weak mayor equaled strong city council, but now we have this thing called neighborhood council, so that we really even have weak city council people. Because you really, that's something that's, that's that's Ray created, bro. Yeah, that's Ray right. right. So, what you have with neighborhood councils is you remove, you sort of, and we did this on purpose, and we thought it was a good idea at the time, and most people supported it, but now you have uh, some inactivity because the people in the neighborhood council, much like the squeaky wheel in every case, make the most noise and sort of freeze the, the city council people from doing things. And the other thing we have for policy gridlock is you have the best example down right behind us is lawyers. And having been a lawyer, the environmental legal community has sued to stop every major project that has been proposed in Los Angeles that they didn't like for one reason or the other. So what we don't have is reasonable discourse at any sense. We have a bunch of people who have their own idea and have the ability in one way or another, be it legally or politically, to just stop something. So that's why we're slow in transit. That's one of the reasons, at least in the last decade, we're slow moving transportation things, is because we have now let too many people in and sort of that whole idea of you want inclusion, but you know, under Mussolini, the trains ran on time, um, is a dichotomy that we have not solved. Yeah. Let me make one statement and then ask you another question. Okay, so what the constant theme that you've seen from all four of our panelists are old players and new players. Who are the old players uh, in terms of your, your civic leaders? And so who are the new players? We talked about environmentalists, neighborhood councils. Uh, we talked about uh, immigrants and, different, and labor unions. So that it's really a, a different LA to the new players and the old players. But we also seem to be saying that old LA seemed to work and it built, it built on tangible things. But it didn't particularly work when it came to intangible things like integrating immigrants or having the police department police the community correctly and all that. Um, but given all that environment, you are a work a policy maker. Um, in, in the back room when you guys are talking about this, how cognizant are you of all this kind of stuff, or is it just the immediate bill that's before you, and are you looking at the consequences of that? How does that, how does that work? No, I, I think you are, to, most people go to, to, to Sacramento or to the city council or to whatever office they go to with an idea of doing something. 
<laughs> then what happens is that you find out that you need to convince these other people to share your vision. Uh, and you know, I learned this when I first went to Sacramento. I got to get, and when I was in the assembly, you got to get 41 people to agree with you. Well, even in the best of times, there are 25 people who disagree with you and disagree with you for legitimate reasons because the people in their district don't agree with whatever that concept is. And so you can't even denigrate, there's no right or wrong, there's really just do we go in this policy direction or that policy direction. And I think part of the problem is civil discourse has just gotten nastier over the last couple of decades. Um, people in the generation before me, uh, Republicans, Democrats used to hang out and go out to dinner and socialize. None of that happens anymore. Um, you've got a, you know, you've got, you've got Democrats where if you don't meet a certain litmus test, then you get, you know, hit pieces by the environmental community. And you've got Republicans who, if you get, if you move a little bit toward being moderate, will actually raise enough money and try to take you out in a, in a primary. So I think political discourse has just gotten, you know, to be very nasty. I call it the TMZ of, you know, politics. And we, we certainly have seen that at the, um, in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. But Rafe and Steve, I don't think we see that at the city level, at the city council level. Mostly because at, at the LA City Council, there's 15 members of the LA City Council. I think they're all, you know, uh, Democrats or even further well, left. It's not partisan, but it tends to be your neighborhood council. You know, for instance, Jack Weiss ran for city attorney. City attorney. Most people believe that the main reason he lost is because there was a vocal, there was a vocal group of people who did not want a specific development in Century City. Now, maybe that's not the only reason he lost, but one of the major issues was there was a small group of people who were particularly vocal about a particular development in Century City um, who raised the most ruckus. Um, a guy named Tyrone Bahey almost got elected to, you know, within a few hundred votes, I think, uh, to, to succeed him because he had rounded up these neighborhood council people. Um, so I think there's so many voices now that we've given, we, we've said everybody should have a voice and we've given them all a platform, and that platform, frankly, has caused us gridlock. So then the gridlock and the conflict is not Democrat versus Republican, but a different level, because it's a nonpartisan right. city. So again, we're at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, we have some great guests here, Dr. Ray Sonenshine from Cal State Fullerton, uh, Dr. Stephen Erie from the University of California, San Diego, Dr. Nick Rosendahl from Loyola Marymount University, and former state senator, uh, Kevin Murray. Uh, the question. Hello, um, I'm Asia Kuala, I'm a junior transfer. And my question is, in regards to immigration, um, how different were the immigration policies um, from old Los Angeles in regards to, you know, the new Los Angeles? Are there any differences or, you know, just any type of information regarding that? Yeah, let's let turn to Nick and the, the type of immigrants that arrive in LA today versus the type of immigrants that used to arrive in the 50s and 60s, and even going back, back further. Um, and certainly the city of LA doesn't form federal immigration, but they, in a sense, almost had immigration policies uh, when, when they try to keep the Okies out and send the LAPD to the Nevada border and things of that nature. Nick? Well, yeah, I'd say um, the immigrant makeup of old Los Angeles is shaped certainly by federal immigration law, um, but also by the uniqueness of Southern California as a region. Um, so in the first half of the 20th century, there are successive waves of, say, Asian immigrants who are coming to um, the Los Angeles area, largely work in agriculture, but also um, into the city at the same time, Latino immigration, um, uh, especially after the 1924 Immigration Act, which cut off so much immigration from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, and um, Southern California business owners look to Mexico in particular, Mexico and Asia as um, sources of, of, um, uh, of, of immigrant labor. Um, things changed dramatically after 1965 because of um, the overhaul of federal immigration law in 1965, and so larger numbers of, of immigrants um, coming from other parts of the world, uh, um, both legal and undocumented immigration. I think one of the big things that's changed since 1965 is uh, a very middle class uh, or even affluent uh, immigrant population um, from places, um, say like. Uh, in Taiwan or the Middle East, um, so much of um, the 
the economic development of uh, Los Angeles post-1965 has depended upon these immigrant streams, as well as uh, continuing streams of undocumented immigrants from, from Mexico, but also now from Central America, especially um, since the 1980s. Yeah, you know, know immigration is such an important <laughs> theme throughout the history, and I want to have both Rafe and Steve comment on that, but there's also what I like to call the, the myth of immigration, or the myth of multiculturalism, because LA, especially in the 1900 census, according to one of the books that the uh, class is reading there, uh, Vogel Harrigan book, he actually has a footnote there that calls LA the most white, non his yeah, the, the whitest major city in American history. Um, so that, that students, I know, when you look out today and you drive through Los Angeles, you, you, you know, it's tough to find, you think it's tough to find black guys in couple cities, it's tough to find white guys almost anywhere else in parts of that. It's interesting, East LA, you know, is not a part of the city of Los Correct. Angeles. So a lot of this is how you play with the numbers. If, if all of the Latinos are in East Los Angeles, as we all thought they were, it's not a part of the city of Los Angeles. Sure. Um, to be perfectly blunt, between the comparison of New York and Los Angeles, Los Angeles has been unremittingly hostile to immigrants for about 100 years compared to New York City. The whole doctrine of the melting pot is a New York concept, it is not a Los Angeles concept. And even at the time when Los Angeles was the most seen as a white city, it was partly because of the almost total invisibility of people who lived there, not their absence. And in fact, all the way into the 90s, New York City was still actually much more pro-immigrant in its local policies than Los Angeles. But what changed was simply the mobilization of overwhelming numbers of Latino residents into politics, which really transformed this after 1994 when Prop 187 was put on the ballot to prevent undocumented residents from getting public services. And then two years later, a Republican Congress went after legal immigrants and their benefits as well. One million new Latino voters entered the California voting rolls in the decade of the 90s, and the overwhelming majority were in the Los Angeles area. And when organized labor saw their potential, labor dropped its long-standing opposition to immigrant labor and began to organize Latino workers in Southern California. Those factors together took a community that was essentially anti-immigrant, where there was no melting pot model, and seven years later, uh, you had a Latino candidate for mayor with a serious chance of four years after that he was elected. So I wouldn't want, I would never pretend that Los Angeles has essentially been a melting pot city. The melting pot model in LA is very new and still unfamiliar. And I will tell you this, I teach in Orange County, I live in Santa Monica. Every time I open my mouth. Why are you complaining about traffic? You live in, I mean, you're doing this to yourself. Don't mess with me. <laughs> I'm making a point here. My New York accent is starting to come out. It's been 35 years. I'm talking here. <laughs> Basically, when I open my mouth on immigration, most things I talk about, nobody pays any attention to. The minute I say a word about immigration, my email starts jumping. I get the long letters, single space, three pages about these damn immigrants and what they're doing and why don't you understand that it's ruining the country. That doesn't happen in New York. New York still has, even with the current generation of immigrants, they just don't get a chance in politics because they can't break past the political machines. So anyway, it's an odd sort of situation. Greater political success in recent years, as Fernando has documented, but not because of a great acceptance of the notion of immigration or an ultimate time. Just to echo some of the things that Ray really has said, you know, it's not just federal immigration policy that sort of filtered down and sort of shaped the waves, the demographic waves in Los Angeles. It was policy, you know, the, the anti-melting pot policy. And it wasn't only things like restrictive covenants and redlining. Uh, it was also covenants. restrictive covenants. Basically, you could not purchase if you were an African American, a Jew, Latino, Asian, uh, uh, couldn't purchase a house. Redlining. I mean, I looked at the the Homeowner Loan Corporation 1935 redlining maps for Los Angeles that basically made it next to impossible right for minorities to get a home loan. Here in Westchester, the deeds. Many of them from the 60s still say you can't sell to black No, my, my, my house that was built in 1949 after the famous <laughs> case, in the deed says you cannot sell this house to a 
Negro, Mexican, Japanese, or Jew? Oh, let, just let, oh, let, I don't know what I told my wife, but anyway. <laughs> it, it wasn't only these kinds of policies, but it was also direction from the business community. You know, one of the great untapped archives in Southern California are the stenographic transcriptions of the board of directors meetings of the LA Chamber of Commerce. And this isn't like the congressional record, right, where they get to go back and sort of rewrite it. They didn't realize that this was going to go public. It's over at USC's Department of Special Collections. There are discussions in the 1920s in the Chamber of Commerce board about how to encourage desirable immigration to Los Angeles and discourage undesirable immigration, so that anti-melting pot, remember, the 1920s, H.L. Mencken, the great writer and satirist from Baltimore, came to Los Angeles and called it Double Dubuque. Dubuque, Iowa, because there were so many corn-fed fed white Midwesterners in this, in this town. So getting into the game, now one thing that, that we need to note about getting in, getting skin into the game politically was the role that district elections played. Los Angeles, 15 council districts, it goes back to the 1920s, 25 charter. It had nothing to do right with minority empowerment. A lot of it had to do with keeping the Harbor District and the Valley and other sort of rest of secessionary uh, parts of Los Angeles inside. But we are one of the few uh, southwestern cities and west coast cities that had district elections in the 1950s and 1960s. In fact, by the mid-1960s, I think there were, what, Kevin, three African American cities on the city council. You couldn't say that about any other place, including progressive San Francisco. Progressive San Francisco has only come for its board of supervisors. It's a little different. Two, two district elections recently, it may have been progressive in terms of anti-growth politics, but not certainly in terms of minority representation. And that was one of the ways that rule of the game, which we got in LA, not because it was a response to, uh, to minority demands, but that, in a sense, right, helped open the door because the Bradley Coalition was formed first in the city council with district elections before it went citywide. Uh, with the mayor's office. Right, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> All right, I'm having a lived in LA for the past few years. Uh, name, name, and Oh, I'm Daniel Drennan, and I'm a junior at Loyola Marymount okay, University. And your, and your favorite professor? Um, he's sitting right over there, oh. kind of the fourth wall. say, which one? All the time. All right, so like I said, I've only lived in LA for the past few years. Um, I've only been able to see the unintended consequences of these neighborhood councils. And um, what was their original purpose or intention? And do you believe that they should try to bring back the power they were given to these councils? Or should we move back to like the old, old LA and LA brand? Just to make you make a mistake. Okay. Oh. No. No, we'll put Great question. We're going to first give them some context as to why we're all pointing at you. I was the last one here. <laughs> All right. Um, in 1999, the, the new city charter that I worked on, uh, one of the principal recommendations was the creation of a system of neighborhood councils that would provide community input into City Hall. Um, contrary to what everybody at this table either says or believes, um, I am not totally convinced that the system has failed. I think the system has many problems. Uh, the system was created because City Hall in Los Angeles really did suffer from a profound lack of responsiveness throughout the community, which fueled a secession movement in the San Fernando Valley, an even stronger one in the Harbor area that was actually much stronger than the one in the Valley, uh, and various other parts of the city. The lack of political organizations meant it was very, very difficult to get access to City Hall. The problem is the city never wanted a system of neighborhood councils. Um, and I know that from being in the middle of this debate. 
and they did everything they could to make sure the city neighborhood council system would not work, and in some ways they were successful. Um, a lot of people got active in the neighborhood councils that shouldn't have. Uh, some of the misused money that was made available to the neighborhood councils, the city provided limited oversight, which kind of allowed that to happen. I thought that was a formula for giving somebody enough throat to hang themselves. Very smart move. Uh, so you're saying that was intentional? I am saying it was not intentional, but there was a sense that I had from the start that the city's attitude was, if you're going to force these things on me, you make them work. You figure out how to make them work. We'll put some minimal resources in, and if they don't work, we'll be able to tell everybody that we were right all along. In reality, some of the neighborhood councils worked very well. Some of them worked very poorly. Uh, one of the best examples of success was in the Northwest San Fernando Valley, a neighborhood council that I knew very well, in a very thorough and open process, in consultation with their council member, stopped a Home Depot development that should not have been built in that area under the plan that it presented. That, to me, was a legitimate use. Other neighborhood councils, just as, as Kevin points out, were absolutely dead set against any growth of any kind and saw themselves as a total adversary of City Hall. I thought that was a mistake. And I spent many nights explaining to them that the purpose of neighborhood participation is not to bring down City Hall and not to bring everything to a halt. Right now, they're under tremendous pressure from, the, from City Hall to either be abandoned or to, um, to be defunded. Um, I think their mission needs to be refocused. I always thought the mission of the neighborhood council was to provide input to City Hall that it was not getting. It has never really achieved that, that mission. I, for one, am not willing to give up on them, but I am willing to accept responsibility and discussion for the fact that in some ways they've gone off the rails. And in some ways I, don't, I think the city bears a lot of responsibility. When your kids are running around the streets getting into trouble, it may have something to do with your parenting skills. When you set up a system of citizen participation, roll out a ball and say, we won't provide much guidance, we won't provide much support, and if you screw up, it's because you wanted to do this thing in the first place, I think that's kind of bad leadership as well. So I think there's tons of blame to go around. I don't want to see the system abandoned, but I do want to see it uh, strongly refocused. Kevin, can you respond yeah, to that? I, 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 I'm sort of agree, uh, agree with you. I think they don't work, and I think they're based upon two flawed concepts. One is, as much as we can talk about the, the, the academics of community participation, they were really formed in response to a threat by people in the San Fernando Valley and in the Harvard District who complained that they weren't getting their fair share. They kept electing their city council people. Uh, in fact, the mayor Jimmy Hahn was a long time, Mayor Jimmy Hahn was a long time San Pedro guy, and the people in the valley kept electing their person, and they had very talented people represented. Uh, but it was really in response to secession threats. So what happened is we had problems in two places in the city, and we created this mechanism for what I believe are mostly gadflies to then exert themselves in all of the other areas. And so the other thing is that while it might have been interesting to formalize an advisory type situation, we sold this, whether it's in the document or not, we sold this as a way for a neighborhood council to truly participate. So in their mind, many of them think that means they have the power to make the decisions that used to be vested and probably still are legally um, in their city council person. So they have really caused and even if you forget about the kinds of corruption that comes in there, but you know, a lot of this is everywhere other than San Pedro and in the Valley, um, it began to be populated by people, by people who were ambitious. They had maybe been neighborhood block club leaders and just wanted more. And that always can get people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't have done. So if they were truly advisory, I think they might work so a little better. Would you get rid of them if you had the power to? Absolutely. Okay. Overnight. Nick? Um, I just want to make two quick points. Uh, one is I don't think this is the first time we've seen the abuse of something that was meant to be a progressive, democratic-minded reform. So for instance, the statewide initiative process or the process of recall yeah. are both progressive-era reforms over 100 years old that were meant to, to 
give more power to voters. Um, however, they've been hopelessly hijacked by big money and special interest groups to the point that now we completely ignore the guy with the clipboard in front of Trader Joe's who we know he's being paid to collect signatures and to the point where we now have uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as a governor of California who's both you know, outgrowth of what has become of these processes. Um, the second point I would make is that this also proves that your professors aren't all theory and hot air, they can actually make things happen. Or not. Or not. Too. They can, we can in this process. So. And uh, Rick, one, one more. Uh, California right now is going through a constitutional, or well, they're thinking about a constitutional convention, it's going to be on the initiative. <coughs> that is to revise the constitution. What LA basically did when they did charter reform was to revise its constitution. Charter stands for constitution. Mm -hmm. what, you just read an article about giving them advice. Well, what, what Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Thanks. thanks. Um, it's my job to read some. Google. These days, the great thing about the internet is when you get pissed off about something, you can just write it down. Um, I got a bunch of phone calls about the state constitutional convention that was being discussed, and people asked my advice. And I said, well, have you considered the experience of charter reform commissions? And they said, no. And I said, well, should you? We got kind of quiet on the phone, so I decided to write it instead. Which is, there's talk about a constitutional convention that would have as many as 600 people as delegates to the convention, and in my view, it would be rather a magical process that would work perfectly, because as you know, 600 people can make really good decisions all together. So I wrote an article based on the six or seven commissions I've worked with to explain how maybe 15 or 20 people, if you work really hard over a long period of time, you might come up with some really good ideas and some really good reforms. How long it would take, how to design your staff, how to get things like that. I'm hoping now that as people debate this, they will start to think about how to make it work. Uh, it isn't going to be James Madison and George Washington and all of that stuff. And by the way, that was only 57 people. But the people I talked to on the phone there would be no problem if you had 600 people as long as they were perfectly representative of the whole state. I presume they had never served on a jury. Um, anyway, I tried not to be sarcastic in the article, which I hope it didn't come across as kind of snide. Yeah, thank you for the question. The next question. Hi, I'm Monique from the senior. And I noticed that all of the panelists have mentioned kind of the centrality of ethnic politics to the city. And I wanted to know that now that more attention has been brought to environmental concerns. Do you think that these environmental concerns can somehow, will, will dominate ethnic issues? And kind of the second part of the question is just in general, how will environmental issues impact the broader LA political atmosphere? You know, let's turn to uh, Nick for some of this and kind of also elaborate that many of the environmental uh, organizations are ethnically look very different than LA. I mean, just to be quite honest, they're mostly, dealt, uh, they're mostly led by Anglo-Americans and, and oftentimes going to communities uh, in, in Latino communities, African-American communities about doing the, doing the right thing, that they ought to be fighting this, et cetera. So it's definitely a new player by environmental activists, and they certainly have a, a lot of mobilization that they've been undertaking and have aligned themselves oftentimes with labor, sometimes with immigrants, and clearly a, a new player. Comment on that. Um, yeah, um, I mean, one, one thing to say is that it's tough to, you know, reading the past hundred years of Los Angeles history to see much of an influence of the environmental movement um, in 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 the city. Um, I think that the the most promising places for coalitions between environmental organizations, the U.S. have often traditionally been white middle class organizations and uh, communities of color would be in a kind of more demand of environmental justice movement. So, um, you know, looking at urban neighborhoods and fostering a more sustainable or more healthy environment within those neighborhoods. So certainly, you know, if you look somewhere like the, the neighborhoods around the ports, um, uh, that is a constant issue in some place like San Pedro where the air quality is so terrible, where uh, children are first, you know, growing up with asthma because of, you know, the big social reports you know, these are tend to be predominantly uh, uh, ethnically diverse working class neighborhoods. Um, I think I even see this 
uh, I also teach a class in the American West, and one of the, the themes of that class is environmental history or the history of the environmental movement. And uh, what I see is when I talk about environmental justice or urban environmental issues, students perk up a little bit. But when I talk about um, uh, you know the Sierra Club or uh, uh, you know other organizations, it seems a little bit abstract. So I think that um, you know there, there are interesting possibilities for kind of merging the environmental movement with ethnic politics, if that's you know, the, uh, the basis of your question. Um, and I think there have been some trends in this direction. And for instance, Laura Polito, who teaches at USC, has written some books on environmental justice in Los Angeles and environmental justice movements. And perhaps that is the, the center of environmental organizing in Los Angeles. Well, Kevin, I mean, you represented it most. Yeah, I think the environmental organizations tend to be involved in things like environmental justice and uh, urban environment when it suits them. Um, in every other case, they <coughs> have been problems rather than help. <coughs> no. when, when Antonio we were not close and I in the maybe early 2000 were trying to do a park bond and wanted to do urban parks and there was a big, big push toward urban park. Our biggest opposition was the traditional environmental organizations because they wanted to spend all the money on open space. In fact, Tom Hayden, who was actually great on this issue from my perspective, had a hearing over at the Penn Yards uh, to talk about what to do about environmental things and why you know Los Angeles happens to be park poor in terms of urban greener. Um, to talk about what to do about urban parks and this kind old gentleman from the Sierra Club who is probably a lefty in his heart and probably doesn't think he has a racist bone in his body, he said, well, uh, people in the inner city, what we can do is bust them to the Santa Monica Mountains so that they can enjoy it all. Uh, and as much as that is a little bit of an anomaly, it is not too far from the thinking. Uh, 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 one of my colleagues, Senator Martha Scudia, has had as a big core issue for her environmental justice. The biggest problem, the biggest opposition she had to most of the things she wanted to do um, had to do with the big environmental organizations. Um, she, wanted to, she wanted to clean things up in her district, but also encourage development. So to the extent that she had two, separate, two different goals and it was trying to merge them, the environmental organizations had sort of a no retreat policy based upon what they thought was the thing to do. So what they do is if you don't do what they say, they sue you. Uh, and they drag him into court for years and years and years. So, and, and by the way, as, as Fernando mentioned, there are almost no faces of color involved in any of the major environmental organizations. And, you know, I wrote the solar rebate legislation in California, and there are a couple of others of us who have been aggressive in this, but we have never been embraced by any of the major environmental organizations, either for, either for justice or for just general development type. Yeah, you know, um, Latinos are actually very environmentalist. I mean, if, if non-Latinos used mass transit to the same extent as Latinos did, race would have gotten here 15 minutes early. That's true. It would have been, there would be absolutely no traffic. Maybe they understood transit dependency. Yeah. We have a better, if uh, non-Latinos used uh, square footage space in terms of the housing to the same degree as Latinos, <laughs> there would be absolutely no housing shortage in California. You got us all beat up. Okay, <laughs> Steve. One, one of the interesting things in, in Los Angeles is that you're beginning to see on specific issues the emergence of this odd fellow coalition of environmentalists and organized labor. Yeah. The solar power initiative, uh, the clean trucks initiative down the boards. The labor unions see this as jobs. This is a jobs issue. Ordinarily in the past, labor was part of the growth machine and the environs were there to stop it. Watch this very carefully, right, in terms of the, the future of the But explain to the students, because we are going to have, in a couple of weeks, Maria Elena is also going to be on the panel. Explain the solar initiative and the DWP and why the unions were for that. Well, it, 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 it sort of created a monopoly, right? Uh, the fellow by the name of Brian Darcy, and this is uh, the Local 18, the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, that basically this is a union leader. This is a union leader. Uh, some think that he runs and has run the Department of Water and Power for a lot of years. But, but basically, they would be the ones doing the installation of the solar panels. It was like a jobs program. 
all around the city. So, but, but watch this. Um, I, this is a very, not only the solar panels, not only on public buildings, but on private on buildings. It was a question of who was going to own them, too, right. if you recall. So, right. Right. So they, they, they put the city, along with IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which is the union of the members of the DWP, put an initiative on the ballot to have the city support solar panels. And everybody's for that. But within the initiative, only they could install them, which meant that their union membership would almost double in, in, in size. And they came back from having opposed it at the state level. Correct, because they didn't care about that then. Interestingly enough, a lot of other unions opposed it because it excluded them. So that is, they had interesting problems. Thank you for your question. Good evening, guys. I'm John Agnes, I'm a senior here at LMU. I actually have three questions for you, if you don't mind, Eric. Quickly. Okay. <laughs> I'll be fast. Um, one is if political, excuse me, if political discourse has gotten to a point where everyone has their own opinion and wants to stop any kind of progressive action, if we have let too many people into politics, is there a way to organize a coalition to fix the obstruction and move the ball forward? That's one. Two, isn't there a way for Los Angeles to restructure the power in the marriage system so it's as effective as the marriage system in New York? And three, is there a way to organize another coalition for the five regional counties of LA to meet and cooperate? Thank you. Great, John. Uh, political discourse obstruction, we're going to give that to Steve, the restructuring for a more powerful mayor to raise, and the coalition for the five county areas to Kevin. I, I'm not, I am not the person, really, to answer the first question. I, I, you know, what limited expertise I have is more on question three. There's a reason why we're going okay, to answer question three. I'll switch with you. I'll so switch. Let's start. Let's, let's <laughs> answer them in the order of the issue. Hey, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to this panel. Right? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, for about 26 years, I taught American government the introductory class to a class about this size. And until this year... He got to know every single one of his students. Absolutely. Until this year, it was kind of fun to talk about checks and balances and the great fascination of American democracy. I don't think it's funny anymore. American democracy right now is a joke. I mean, democracy to a political scientist is about majority rule, competitive elections, and when the majority wins, they get to implement their policies until the public gets sick of them, and then the other party gets to come in. We are in a fundamental crisis in California and in Washington, D.C. And ironically, the party that wins gets blamed for that structure. We have a California system where it requires a two-thirds vote to pass a budget and raise taxes, which I think is insane. It's as if it's popular to raise taxes. You have to punish people when making it impossible. And in Washington, we have the House of Blowhards, known as the Senate, in which it apparently takes 60 votes to breathe, not because it's in the Constitution, but because it's in the rules of the Senate, and God help us if we were to threaten the rules of the Senate. I look at this, and I just tear my hair out, because I'm a political scientist who thinks the majority should get a chance to carry out. Now, until this year, it wasn't quite as bad a crisis, because usually the minority party would let most things happen and had majority support. When you have a unified minority party that will use every procedure to stop anything from happening, and has figured out quite smartly that the majority party will then get blamed for not getting things done, despite the fact that they have obstructed it. Uh, it is, I don't know about you, but I go crazy watching this stuff, thinking you hold an election, you change things, and then see how it works out. What's the solution? What's the solution? Well, I have two solutions. One is the California Constitution should be amended by a vote of the people, and it should have a majority rule for budget and taxes. I don't know if that will happen, but I think you put it on the ballot every single year until there's like a big bad weather day, and the right people turn out, and you win it. And then you go on from there. In the Senate, I think at the close of this congressional session, the, uh, when the Senate reforms for the next session is the time you can change the rules, I think they should just blow the whole thing up and with a majority vote abolish the filibuster completely. 
Now, do they have the nerve to do that? You must be kidding. But the alternative is what we've got right now, which is the inability to carry out American democracy. When I look at the U.S. Senate right now, I know they all think they're like senators in the Roman Empire wearing togas and they're so wise. If the Roman Empire was run this way, it would have lasted about a month as opposed to several thousand years, whatever hundreds of years it was. To me, I guess what I used to teach about the fascinating interplay of the different government institutions, I don't find that entertaining anymore. I find it just makes my blood boil. So I think that we've actually got to do something. To and you don't need to amend the US Constitution to change the Senate. You just need to change the Senate rules. Right. Second question about making the mayor stronger. I would not make the mayor of Los Angeles stronger. The problem is we, we already made the mayor stronger with the new charter. I think the mayor has all the power the mayor needs. The problem is ultimately that all the elected officials really don't have enough authority, popularity, and strength to really make the hard decisions. I give the mayor credit right now. The city council is very nervous about making cuts. The mayor is threatening layoffs, which is very unpopular with his uh, labor constituency, extremely unpopular. Um, it's easy if you're not supported by labor to talk about laying off city employees. He is, and he's making those threats. I think he's going to have to carry those out. The city is in such terrible trouble. The city council would much rather have the mayor make those decisions. How much do you think term limits play in that? I think term limits have actually been good for Los Angeles and terrible for the state of California. I think term limits have destroyed the state legislature in California. And I think there's really good people like you who have been up there, but haven't been able to get anything done. I think the city of Los Angeles, when it instituted term limits, had too many people who had been there too long who didn't want to change anything. And I actually think they've gotten a, a good rotation of a lot of interesting people. There. The problem for the city is, is revenue. The rules about raising revenue and taxation in New York is infinitely easier than the but East Coast. don't you think if you didn't have term limits, you might have some whether you got a new crop of them or not, have a little more gravitas to actually do some stuff without worrying about the consequences. Looking yeah, but I have to tell you, I dealt with some of those gravitas folks up close and personal, and uh, you sort of had to drag them out when they were about 110 years old, and their gravitas had turned into God knows what. And the fact is, they didn't want to do anything at a certain point because they were going to be there forever. Steve, uh, regional fragmentation. The problem is you've got to look at the distribution of benefits and costs. You look at you look at projects, and depending upon how that plays out among the subregions, the counties, right? You get cooperation or you get conflict. You know we've got a, uh, a rail a regional rail system, right? And if you look at the, the distribution of benefits and costs, it tends to benefit the counties. They may have to fund it, you know, and there are safety issues, but we have a regional rail authority. We attempted Cliff Moore at, at LAX for years, tried to breathe life into a regional airport authority to basically spread the load from LAX. We put all of our sort of eggs in one basket, not only to Ontario, which is part of the LA airport system, which may now be privatized, but to new airports in Orange County in the outlying areas. The problem with a project like airports is the benefits, the economic benefits are widely dispersed. The environmental costs are heavily concentrated. And so what you really got from the outlying counties that, had, that continued to rely upon LAX and to a lesser extent Ontario was not in my backyard. You saw El Toro crash and burn, you know, Orange County, when it rejoined the Southern California Regional Airport Authority, which was composed of many of these counties and the city of Los Angeles, basically said, we're going to have, even worse than the filibuster, we're going to have a veto system. Any member can veto a project, and that was to keep another airport out of Orange County, you know. And when you look at those kinds of, of distributions, you begin to understand, right, why we don't have a regional solution to something like, like airports. Okay, thank you for the questions. All right. Uh, okay, let's give a good little Marymount University thank you. See you guys next week, and if some of you want to come and ask for more questions, some of the speakers will stick around for a while.